Okay, so we're going to talk about now how to define bow hold. And we'll have a chance, actually, if we can, to pull out your bows, because I want you to try some of these old bow holds. It's pretty fun. So we'll do that in a second. But before, I thought it was important as I was doing my research to actually define how we define bow hold. So there are a couple different elements that make up your bow hold. One is the distance between your fingers on your right hand. So I'm talking like, is it closed? or is it open, or how far apart are these fingers, right? You'll see a wide variety of how far apart these fingers are. The next is going to be the placement of the thumb in relation to the other fingers. So sometimes some people are across first and second finger, some are more close to two, second and third, right? So there's some variation with that. The third would be the contact point of the index finger with the bow, right? So that's just talking about where on your index finger is your bow touching. So where does the stick touch? Um, and we talked a little bit about that, right, with, with Vinyavsky of him being closer to that second joint. And then if the last would be the pinky's contact throughout the stroke. So there's some bow holds where the pinky has to remain in contact with the stick the whole entire time from frog to tip, and others that we'll talk about where the pinky may come off. So the pinky's role is also important in that. There are ele other elements, I guess I should mention, like how your wrist looks, how your arm looks, all of these other things. Um, I didn't specifically, I guess, talk about all those elements, but I did talk a little bit about pronation, so also like how far you're tilted, basically, and with your wrist, and then also if your wrist goes basically concave. I, is this called pronation, supination? I'm not actually, actually sure, but... Okay, so let's talk first about Leopold Mozart because I threw this in there as just kind of a early, early time period. So do you guys want to grab out your bows and try this? It's pretty fun. <laughs> let's try to play like Mozart. And as you can see, his bow is different, right? So it's a lot thicker there at the bottom and then the bow bows were much shorter. I think the university published it, but I'm not sure. I have to go back and look. I was really careful to not use pictures <laughs> that were not in copyright so that I could, yeah. <laughs> so luckily, the nice thing is, we'll, we'll show some pictures from this book by Leopold Auer. They just went out of copyright this year. So oh, it was nice. perfect. <laughs> so this was the time to do it, I guess. This was the year. OK, great. So this is Mozart, Leopold Mozart's writings. This is what he said. The bow is taken in the right hand, well we all know that right hand, good, okay, at its lowest extremity, so at the frog, right, between the thumb and middle joint of the index finger or even a little behind it. So the bottom picture should show you where your thumb is supposed to be. It's kind of across from the first and second fingers, which is probably different than most of you do. The pinky should remain in contact with the stick of the bow. So that means as you're playing up bow and down bow, that pinky's got to stay on. So this is also a little different than what we'll talk about later with the Russian bow hold. And then the index finger must not be stretched too far over the bow or too far from the other fingers. So look up there. It says in little tiny words, the error. So this is the wrong way, according to Mozart. <laughs> As if you see how there's space between that first finger and that pinky finger. I think often it's more common in the Franco-Belgian bow hold of today to have a little bit more space like that. But Mozart's... He, this is Mozart, of course, Mozart's father, right? Leopold Mozart did not agree with that. So no space is allowed. So this is like an early bow hold example. And I just, it's just cool to kind of see where these bow hold ideas come from. Now, by the time we get to 1924, Carl Flesch had discovered, or had basically decided that there were three distinct bow holds. Carl Flesch was an imp another important pedagogue um, during the 19th, 20th century, mostly 20th century. He should be on your, on your genealogy as well. So, yeah, and if you've played Carl Flesch scales systems, that's, I mean, the Bible of the scales. <laughs> it's from him. This is the guy. So 
he came up with basically he from observing other violinists and from his research he said there were three types of bow holds in 1924 so remember this is a little dated and the three he came up with were the older German hold the new Franco-Belgium hold and the newer Russian hold and he's calling them German Franco-Belgium Russian because of those violin schools that he's seen these things come from so that's why we talked about that earlier so this is the older German bow hold we're going to test this one out so there's three images. The first one kind of shows you the angle of the hand. The second one shows you the contact point. So that little tiny little black square is showing you where you're touching the stick with that index finger. This one's a weird bow hold. <laughs> it is weird. And then this is what it looks like. So the fingers were held close together, no space. Why do you think they say no space? Because they're thinking about Mozart, right? Who said no spread apart fingers. So that's coming from that, right? So no space between the fingers. Um, fingers were straight. So remember Emily talking about curved fingers earlier? Well, that was not the case. <laughs> that looks pretty darn straight to me. So those fing fingers were straight. And your pinky couldn't come off the bow. So as you went up and down and up and down, that pinky has to stay on. <laughs> See some of you testing that out. Looks pretty weird, right? Okay. Um, and then the index finger, of course, because those fingers are so straight, only touches right here at that top of that. Um, and the wrist is the least pronated, so it's a flatter wrist for this bow stroke. Okay, it's weird. <laughs> We're not used to it, right? But this is, this is the, what he called the older, and this is older in 1924, so it's old. <laughs> so we don't use this much now, and I don't know of any violinists that use that bow hold right now. This was called the newer Franco-Belgium hold. Um, this one's actually a little bit more easy to do. Fingers are close together still, but the index finger can stretch forward slightly. Okay, so you can move it a little bit away from your other fingers. Um, so there's a little space there. Now your hand needs to be rounder compared to the last one, so a little more round fingers. And then your pointer finger, see how it's closer to this, what we call the second joint. So this would be the second joint right here. Good. And then the thumb is opposite the middle finger and the wrist is a slightly more curved on this bow hold. It's important to note, a lot of you probably hear of the Franco-Belgian bow holds today, and most of, I mean, probably your peers in other settings play that way. This is not necessarily the exact same bow hold, so keep that in mind. This is the bow hold that Carl Flesch, you know, realized in 1924. The current Franco-Belgian bow hold is a little bit different because it was affected by other pedagogues later after Flesch, like... Suzuki and like Galamian, too. Galamian, yep. And Galamian actually has some of that Russian bow hold influence, so it's just kind of interesting to see how that changed over time. Okay, here's the newest, newest in 1924, okay? Our bow hold is not that new, but newest Russian bow hold. So let's see if this is what we do. Okay, minimal space between the index finger and middle fingers of the right hand, so fingers are close together, right? Does that sound similar to what your teachers say? The thumb was placed between the index and middle finger, so between these two. Now, sometimes I think we go further to the second and third, but this is what Carl Flesch was saying based on his observations. Now, the index finger comes in contact with the bow at the line separating the second from the third joint, so he's showing it up there, like right in between here, right? So there's a little bit of leeway there. We see Heifetz is probably a little bit further there. Some of his counterparts we're a little bit closer to that second joint. So there's, there's some flexibility in that, in that. So it's just between the second and third joint. Now, he talks about the extreme pronation of the hand and wrist. So it's much more turned this way. So if you see that top picture, if you compare it to the last two and see how that's the most flat, and then this is the most turned this way. Does that make sense for us, right? We're the most turned this way so we can use our natural weight. So as he talks about here, Oh, here's the little finger. Let's talk about the pinky. We talked about the pinky actually a lot today, about it being relaxed. Um, the little finger only touches the bow at the lower half while playing. I mean, take this for a grain of salt. But technically speaking, we only need that strength of that pinky right near the frog. Once you get to the tip, it can relax, and it doesn't serve much of a purpose on the bow. So you see some violinists moving their pinky off. I do. <laughs> but... It's, it's, not like on, it's not on purpose, right? You don't have to necessarily do it. But it's not necessary is what he's saying. Consequently, also the index finger guided the bow and controlled how much 
arm weight was transferred into the string in what Flesch called a tone-producing way. So the tone in this bow hold is coming from that contact with the index finger, which we're, we heard about originally, right, with Wieniawski. So here's a side-by-side -side comparison. So you can just kind of see the differences, right? German is held the highest up on this index finger, Franco-Belgium on the second joint, Russian on the third, and then Notice the pronation of the hand, right? Flat for the German, a little bit more turned for Franco-Belgium, and then the most pronated for our Russian hold. Any questions up to this point? I don't need to. Okay. I can send you the slides too if you want them. Now keep in mind, this is what Carl Flesch observed, right, from the time period he was living in. And these are pictures that he took, and this is based on his opinion, right? But this is based just on, you know, what he observed. Can somebody read this, of what Flesch said? Go ahead. Yeah. So, least amount of pressing, get the most, the biggest tone. Flesh pretty much was sold on this whole Russian bow hold. If you read his writings, if you read this, this, where these pictures originate from, you can tell he's, he's pretty convinced that this is the thing of the future. He said, in a couple of years, everybody will be playing this way. That's how he felt. Um, and part of it is because he was observing people like Yasha Heifetz, Misha Elman, and that's where he you know, had kind of figured out what the parameters of the bow hold was. So... Of course, he thought it was the thing of the future because all the greatest violinists were playing that way. Now, this is a picture of Carl Flesch. Him being cool in his little top, his little hat, and then him playing. And if you notice his bow hold, what one would you think it most, most aligns with of the three that we looked at? The German, Franco-Belgium, or Russian? Go ahead. Yeah, I think it's somewhere between Franco-Belgium and Russian because you can tell that his finger is closer to that second joint, right? But he doesn't have a ton of space between the fingers that we might have expected. So another thing to keep in mind, too, when we're looking at pictures is that a lot of times they posed. So this wasn't him in the middle of the concert. This was him taking a picture, right? So sometimes when we set up our bow hold, we set it up in a certain way, but then we're actually playing a little bit different. So it's important to realize that when we're looking at pictures, sometimes it's not a full representation. Maybe he really played closer to the Franco-Belgian way. Maybe he played closer to the Russian way, right? But it's hard to tell from pictures. But we can kind of get an idea from what we see. Okay, these images now come from this book that I had a teacher make me get even before Emily, actually, that first introduced me to the Russian bow hold. Um, Leopold Auer, Graded Course of Violin Playing, Book One. Now he, pretty much in this book, outlines the correct bow hold, which is pretty much what we do. So the thumb provides support to the other fingers. Index finger, control the tone. So these are, he's basically saying what the fingers are responsible for. So in, index finger, tone producing, right? That's where we transfer the weight into the, into the stick and into the bow, and then into the string. Um, the thumb was opposite the middle finger, so Flesh was saying a little bit in between the first and second finger. He's saying more close to that, that middle finger, which is pretty much what we do, right? And then the pinky rests lightly on the stick, and then at times can come off, right? Which is different than the German bow hold we talked about before. So here is his natural drop of the hand and wrist. If your teacher has ever made you do this, who made you do it first? It's really Leopold Dower's fault. So this is where it's coming from. There's that natural drop. Um, and then here is the contact point you can see on his hand. It's a little hard to tell, but it's, it's close to these, these two joints right there. And then you can see the front view and side view are pretty obvious of his bow hold, right? Fingers close together, and then that extreme pronation of that wrist right there. So you have that angle there. And he had fairly long fingers, right? So you can see them wrapped and curled around the bow like that. You know what's interesting about this? Volume one is that the entire volume is all open material. Yeah. The entire, he wanted everybody to get good with the bow before he even added. Yeah, he spends like a lot of time on this, 
on this stuff, yeah, step by step by so step. No, no, that's kind of mm -mm. all yeah. I mean, he must have known what he was doing because his students turned out pretty good. So, I wanted to just play, and let's see if the speaker is on. I want to play a little bit of. Yeah, it's not on. Let's see. We're, yeah, we're gonna listen to Leopold Hour. We don't have any videos. I just turned them off. Oh. It said red, so I didn't know if that was off or on. Power on. Okay, there we go. Okay, Leopold Hour is. Um, we don't have any video. Sorry, we don't have any actual like images of him playing, but we have audio. Let's see if this will play. Oh. Here we go. Yeah. can't tell much obviously from his bow hold from that but we can tell a little bit about his tone it's a really old recording right taken from a record um, but what did you hear what did he sound like was he sustaining his sound did he have a nice tone based on what we could hear it sounded like a really deep tone even like yeah. through the all the static of the recording you can tell you can tell that there's yeah, yeah there's depth definitely that he's sustaining and that he's, he's playing with that natural arm weight that he taught, right? So it's just interesting to listen to those old recordings and kind of get a sense of who these people really were and how they played. So this is Carl Flesch again. The exact, let's have somebody read it so I don't have to read it. Who wants to read? Go ahead. What is this explaining, basically, in a nutshell, that we've talked about today? Weight, thank you. He's talking about natural arm weight. So this is not a new concept. Emily did not come up with this. <laughs> this has been around for a long time. So when we're telling you, when your teachers are telling you, right, relax here, and that you need to have the elbow high enough so that this natural weight is coming through, this is what it's coming from, right? This is the, this is the tradition. So I just really love that explanation there. I think it is a really succinct explanation of it. We're going to listen to some Carl Flesch now. Hopefully this plays. It's also only audio. <laughs> He has a really nice tone. What were you going to say? Uh, like yeah, it does. It sounds like he's using that arm weight and he's doing resistance and all the things that we talk about. So, I don't know. You just don't hear that t type of sound sometimes. Um, well, we do today because we play this way. Right? But um, even in modern recordings, you know, without all that static, it's sometimes hard to be able to hear violinists that are really having that depth to them. So, it's really cool to hear that. Even, you know, a recording, a hundred years old. Yeah. So is the bow hold 
you would say to define technical element of the graduate school or are there things like the grotto or other elements that are also there are more defining or is this pretty much the goal? I would say vibrato is probably the other thing that would be really defining. I didn't re do any research on it. Um, but in terms of like, yeah, probably vibrato would be the biggest, the biggest thing otherwise. Is it safe to say generally speaking that Franco Belgian was players will use a risk vibrato more? Yeah. I don't know who exactly, if that was Suzuki or like Galamian influence? Galamian, yeah, because they, he also wrote, the, what's the name of his book? It's Galamian, oh. Principles of Violin Thinking, yeah. which is treated like the Bible, like, yeah. in other circles. So, yeah. Don't you also say that shift, or like, uh, the way that the shift is initiated and completed is also, is a distinct differentiation between? Probably, but I don't, I mean, I, I, mean, I can only. The same, it's, it's the that's true. Shifting with your arm, yes. Versus yeah. knowing or using wrist or finger motion. Yeah. Right? Yeah, I so think so. It goes to the larger motions. It's, it's, it's the same truth and principles yeah. that are the right time, you know, to become. Yeah, I agree. Right. If you read some of the, like, hours writings and also um, Carl Flesch, you will see things you're like, oh, I do that. Yeah, that's the same way, besides just bow holds. So it's really interesting um, to see that it's not new. <laughs> you know, it's, it's been around. Um, but I wouldn't, I don't know if those things are 100% just the Russian school, right? Because there could have been other teachers teaching that way. So I haven't done any research on it. It'd be a nice second thesis.